Right, moving on now to finding the area under a curve, okay? It is as it sounds, okay? If we're going to have a, basically a graph uh, that's drawn on a set of axes, we basically want to find the area underneath said graph, okay? And that might seem pointless, but it's actually used in a lot of different applications. One of the main ones is to find the speed of an object, okay? If you think you might have a graph that's distance against time, and you looked at them when you were in first and second year, okay, um, what you'd basically find by finding the area under that curve is the speed of that object, okay? So it can be quite useful for that, but it can also be quite useful for um, finding the area of a more awkward shape, okay? If you imagine a kind of a curved area, um, it can be portrayed as a function, um, and we can find the area using this method, okay? But basically what it comes down to is actually integration um, and Actually, all that actually is, is the integration that you've done in terms of definite integrals, okay? So basically um, finding the integral between two points, uh, subbing in those values and ending up with a number. And you'll see that it's actually relatively straightforward um, from the next few slides, hopefully, okay? So um, what we basically have, what we should, what we would have, and in most cases you will be given a diagram, especially in an exam, is you'll have um, some kind of function, okay, drawn like this. It's not necessarily going to look exactly like this. We've got lots of different functions now, okay, but something along these lines, and we'll just call it f of x, okay. Then what we generally have is we'd have two points along that curve, okay. You'd have a point A and you'd have a point B, okay. And what we're looking for is we're looking for the area underneath that curve, basically between the curve, the two lines that we've just drawn and the x axis. Okay, so you can see what I mean, but if you wanted to find an, a an awkward area, <clears throat> uh, we can actually use this method. Otherwise, you're basically counting up little squares and then you end up with little half squares and it's really awkward. Okay, but what integration allows us to do is find the area of that uh, shaded section exactly. Okay, so there's a few things to just be careful of is where A is, where B is, and where the x axis is, and obviously where the curve, the function that we're using, is in relation to those three things. Generally, it's quite clear, clear from the graph that you're given, and as I say, in the majority of cases, you will always be given in a graph, okay, but you've just got to kind of uh, be careful of a couple of things. But in a general sense, the shaded area, in other words, the area between the curve and the x axis, okay, and then obviously kind of hemmed in by the, those uh, values a and b, is found by integrating the equation of the line, okay, substituting in each end of the limit, that's our a and a b, into two separate equations and then finding the difference between these resulting answers, right? That sounds confusing, but that's actually what you've been doing all along in terms of integration, okay? In other words, the area between the curve and the x axis is the integral of the function f of x with respect to x, so just what we've been doing all along, between a and b, okay? So substituting in the a and the b after we've done the integral into two separate equations, okay? So that's covering that bit from before, but generally, as I say, it's just what you've been doing all along. It's just taking it from a situation rather than being given a question as this formula is given here, okay? The f of b minus f of a is just the functions once we've substituted a and b after the integral. Okay, which makes it clear down here, but you don't necessarily need to write that down, okay? So in a situation, we need to know these different points. We need to know the function of the graph that we're finding the, um, the area underneath. We need to know where A is, and we need to know where B is. And there's going to be a couple of other little things that we need to discuss along the way as well, okay? But generally, that's how you find the area between the curve and the x-axis, okay? All right, because this is a definite integral, we don't need to worry about the plus C, okay? So if you remember when we didn't have the numbers A and B, um, then uh, we could we do this um, and then we'd have a plus c at the end. So we do the integral and we'd get the plus c at the end of it all. But because this is a definite integral, because we have those two values there, we don't actually need to worry about the plus c at all in this. Okay? Right. So straight away an example. The diagram shows part of the graph with equation y equals x minus 4 all squared plus 2. Find the shaded area. Okay. So here comes a diagram. So you already know what this graph looks like. Okay, and that's why you wouldn't necessarily always have to have the graph to be able to do this. Okay, but in a general sense, I think you would. Okay, but you knew you'd be able to draw this graph and we're going to find the shaded area. We don't know what the area is between, we don't know these two values, so this is what we'd be given. So the shaded area comes between two and six and the x-axis. So it's that space there that we want to find the area of. Okay, it's not a rectangle or a parallelogram or a triangle or anything like that. So we can't use any other method other than um, integration to do this. Okay, the first thing to do is basically set up your equation. And the equation is just simply that. It's the integral between 2 and 6 of the equation 
uh, f of x, okay, of the function f of x, which in this case is x minus 4 squared plus 2, and it's with respect to x, right? Just remember all these little things that we need to get, make clear, okay? You'll need your dx there, okay? You need to make it clear what you're doing. If you miss that out in this question in an exam, you could end up losing a mark from it. So just make sure you put that dx in, okay? That tells the kind of the marker, whoever's marking this, that you know what you're doing. You're integrating this function with respect to x, okay? So put it in. So from here, it's just a case of um, going back to what we did in terms of different definite integrals, okay? We need to integrate this, uh, and we need to uh, then substitute in the 2 and the 6, take them away, find our answer, okay? A couple of things involved along the way, but generally that's it. So the first thing we want to look at is, is this in integratable form, okay? It's not exactly. We could uh, integrate using the chain rule, but in many ways, it's easier to multiply this out and just make it slightly simpler for ourselves, okay? So just remember with something like x minus 4 squared, it's FOIL. It's not just x squared minus um, 16 or plus 16. Just write it out in full. It's x minus 4 times by x minus 4. So write it out properly and think about it properly. x squared minus 4x minus 4x plus 16. And then we've got the extra plus 2. Gives us x squared minus 8x plus 18. Okay. So we've not integrated at this stage. And this is a mistake I know some of you do. We've not actually integrated at this stage. So we're keeping on writing our integral symbol. It's between 2 and 6. And it's with respect to x. All I did there was just simplify it out. Not done any integration yet. So I'm still making it clear that I intend to integrate. But now I've got to a point where I can, so I can go ahead and integrate, okay? So using my square brackets, x squared integrated is x cubed over 3, minus 8x integrated is minus 8x squared over 2, and then the 18, just be careful, integrated, don't get confused with differentiation, is 18x. And I'm integrating that with uh, between 2 and 6. I'll get to that in a second. Because I'm going to simple, uh, substitute those values in, I want to write it in the simplest form, okay? You, the simplest form is, is up to you, but obviously you can get the 8x squared over 2 simplified. You can write the uh, x cubed over 3 uh, in this way if you want to. You don't have to, though. You can just leave it uh, as x cubed over 3. But bottom line is it's minus 4x squared plus 18x. Uh, and then I'm just going to substitute in my 6 and my 2, Okay. So this is a lot of writing, it's a bit of a faff, but make it clear for yourself. The only person that's going to suffer by uh, you taking shortcuts on this is you, okay? So just write everything in nice and clearly. So the x comes out and the 6 goes in in one equation, and then I'm going to take away the 2 substituted in uh, in a separate equation, okay? So then it's just a case of working all that out. Generally, you, you can shove this in a calculator, but you know from the past um, how many mistakes you end up making with uh, your calculator if you don't do this separately. So it might be better to just do this in stages, okay? 6 cubed is 216, 6 squared 36, 6 is 6, 2 cubed is 8, blah, 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 blah. Right, get to this stage and then just simplify it all down. I prefer to do this um, stage in a couple of, or this these stages in a couple of stage steps. Okay, so I could have done all this in one go and put it in a calculator, um, but I'm just doing it in a couple of stages so that I get it right. Okay, simplify it down and then deal with each bracket separately. The third of eight, eight over three is going to be a little bit awkward, but just it's just taking away fractions at the end of the day. Okay, so you're going to make the 16 and the 36. You can uh, do them added together first of all. Just be very careful with the symbols here. You're taking away 16 and you're adding on 3x. You can leave this separate, but if you minus 16 and add 36, you end up with 20, okay? So 20 and then the 8 thirds basically is 22 and 2 thirds. I think this is where most people get confused with this negative here, okay? First bracket's nice and straightforward, but then we've got 36 minus 22 and 2 thirds, which is just 13 and a third, okay? Right, one thing we've got to be careful of with this question, the one thing that's different once we've actually got through all of this is that this is an area, okay? So we need to make it nice and clear, and you have to write your answer in terms of square units, unless you're told differently, and which generally aren't, you aren't in a situation like this because it's a graph, okay? Well, the only thing we know about the units is that they are units, okay? And because it's area, they would be square units by the end of all this. So it's a 13 and a third. So unit squared, you can write it like that, or square units, it's entirely up to you, but you have to make it nice and clear that it is um, some form of unit, it has some form of unit, even if that is just units, okay? So nothing much different there between what we did um, with definite integrals. It's just a case, case of obtaining the question in the first place, I think, okay? Right, so another slightly different question. The diagram shows part of the graph with equation y equals x squared minus 6x plus 5. The graph intersects the x-axis at p and q. We're going to find the shaded area, right? 
Um, I've put that up before the graph, but uh, hopefully it'll be pretty clear. Right, that's our graph, x squared minus 6x plus 5. <clears throat> the graph intersects the x-axis are P and Q. So I'm guessing these two points here are going to be P and Q. P and Q are on the x-axis, i.e. when y is equal to 0. Okay, it doesn't necessarily matter. But that's the shaded area there, okay, um, that we're trying to find. Okay, so it obviously falls between P and Q, and they lie on the x-axis, but that doesn't mean that they're equal to 0. It just means that y is equal to 0. Okay, so the first thing we want to actually do is find out the x values of those two points. Okay, so... Again, there's kind of different aspects to these questions that might come up, but we want to basically know when x squared minus 6x plus 5 equals 0. So there's a little bit of solving first. This is just a case of um, factorising and then taking each of those brackets and equaling them to 0. x minus 5 equal to 0 solves as x equal to 5, and the other one is x equal to 1, in which case p and q are the points 1 and 5, and we need them for our definite integral, okay? So what we're doing now, once we've established what P and Q are, is we're integrating the function x squared minus 6x plus 5 with respect to x between the points 1 and 5, okay? So from here, that is an integratable form, so we can just bash straight on. x cubed over 3, 6x squared over 2, and 5x between 1 and 5, okay? Simplify it down a little bit, just becomes 3x squared. As you can see, I like to write it with a third in the front, just reminds me, but there's no problem writing as x cubed over 3, okay? Right, from here, a case of getting the two equations and then taking them away from each other. So one equation has five, substituted in instead of the x's. The other one has one, substituted in, and then we are taken away. Okay, just the same as the last one, just different numbers, different equation. So work it through in stages. Make sure you're careful with your um, indices. I've seen a few people in the past, okay, just getting these mud muddled up, squaring when they should be cubing, and so on and so forth. So just take your time. Right. 5 cubed is 125, we're going to divide that by 3, 5 squared is 25, times by 3 is 75, 5 times 5 is 25, 1, obviously cubed, squared, whatever it is, is just the same, so we pretty much get rid of them, it's just a third, minus 3, plus 5. Again, be careful here, if it's minus 3 and then plus 5, that's basically just the same as a third plus 2, and a third plus 2 is just 2 and a third, or 7 thirds. All that simplifies to minus 25 over 3. And what you're going to get is minus 32 over 3, which is minus 10 and 2 thirds. All right. Here lies an issue. This is negative. Okay. We've said in the past, okay, we can't get negative dimensions. We can't get negative areas. So there's a reason for this. There's a reason this is negative, And it's purely the fact that it's below the x-axis. Okay. So when the shaded area is below the x-axis like this, we will get a negative answer. That's fine. And it's a good way of checking that what you've done is correct. Okay. So you should be looking at that at the start from now on and thinking, right, my area is below the x-axis, in which case I should end up with a negative answer. Okay. And we've got a negative answer here. So everything checks in. However, an area can't be negative. So we just make our final statement with a positive area. That's the only thing you need to do. Your area is not minus 10 and two thirds. It's only minus because it's below the x axis. Okay, so we just make it so it's positive, literally just get rid of the negative. The area is 10 and two thirds units squared, square units. Okay. Right, final one. Um, the diagram shows part of the graph with equation y equals four sine x. Okay. Obviously, there's going to be trigonometry, um, and obviously, uh, they're going to make it awkward for you by chucking radians in as well. Okay, this is just getting a, a few different bases covered. Um, we've looked at quadratics, we've looked at when we don't have the x values, and now we're looking at some trigonometry. Okay, we're going to find the shaded area of this one. Okay, so we've got our trig graph. This is 4 sine x, and what we want to find is the shaded area that goes from pi over 3 up until the very end, which will obviously be 2 pi. Okay. Right, this is where you've got to be careful. Because they overlap, because there's, there's basically two different areas here, okay? Because they're split by the x-axis and they're split at this point, okay? We have to do this as two separate calculations. Don't try doing this in one go. What will happen if you do this in one go is that they'll kind of cancel each other out. So you have to do this as two separate calculations. Don't worry, you'll be rewarded with in terms of marks. So yes, it will take longer, but you'll get the marks um, for basically doing the same thing again. Okay, so we're going to split this into two separate calculations. Okay, so area one and area two, you don't have to label them like that. <clears throat> You've just got to think of them in terms of two different areas. Okay, 
So first thing, you, well, one thing you're going to have to do is basically find this area and it's between the uh, this point and this point here. And then the second one will be between those two points is there as well. So we need to establish this point here. It's just a sine, uh, sine x graph. Okay, so it's going to cross the x axis at pi, 180 degrees, and then it's going to come back at 360, in other words, 2 pi. So our two calculations, okay, are basically going to be um, one area between pi over 3 and pi, and the second area between pi and 2 pi. It's the same equation, it's the same function, so we're still just going to use 4 sine x, okay, but just the, um, the interval is going to be different for each one, okay? So the answer is not, and this is what I was trying to make clear at the start, it's not between pi over 3, it's not between the very start and the very end. It doesn't work like that because basically it overlaps the x-axis. We have to do it in two brackets, okay, on two equations, sorry. So area 1 is going to be between pi over 3 and pi, and it's just going to be 4 sine x dx, okay? And we can integrate that easy enough. There's nothing really we need to change there, and the answer is uh, actually basically in our formula sheet. 4 sine x integrates to minus 4 cos x. Again, don't be confused with integration and differentiation. And it's between pi over 3 and pi. Okay, it's actually a lot more straightforward than it looks because we've only got the one x. Um, and we're just going to substitute in pi to the first one and pi over 3 to the second one. But this may be a non-calculated question because obviously we've got exact values. All right, cos of pi. Okay, so just thinking in terms of um, your cos graph is minus 1, so it's basically minus 4 times by minus 1, which is positive 4. Cos pi over 3, pi over 3 is 60 degrees, and cos 60 is a half, so it's minus 4 times by a half. All of that simplifies nice and easily to 6, okay? All right, that's just the first part, that's just this area here. So now we want to do the same kind of idea for the second area, okay? In which case, our uh, equation looks virtually the same, but remember it's between pi and 2 pi this time, but we're still using 4 sine x, that doesn't change. It's just the interval that changes. Okay, so we're going the um, uh, same integral, and you use your same integral from the first one. You don't need to do this twice, but it's just we're going to be what you substitute in the second part that's going to be different. So we're going to substitute in 2 pi, and we're going to substitute in pi. So cos 2 pi, 2 pi is just 2 lots of 180, so it's 360. And on a cos graph, we're at 360 at 1, so it's minus 4 times by 1. Pi is still minus 1. Simplify all that down, and it's minus 8. Again, we knew it to be minus 8 because we've got our area below the x-axis, okay? But again, you can see this is where it's going to be a little bit more awkward. It's not an area of minus 8. You can't start doing 6 plus minus 8. Okay, because they'll cancel each other out, basically. It's 6 plus 8. So you have to make this a positive value first of all, and then add them together. Okay, so the total area is 14 square units. Just a couple of little things to watch out for there. Okay.